Welcome to the Transforming Trauma Podcast. Transforming Trauma is presented by the NARM Training Institute. I'm your host, Emily Ruth, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. Hi, Transforming Trauma listeners. Do you want to join the international NARM community in support of trauma-informed care? If so, please consider joining us to become trained in the Neuroaffective Relational Model. We are excited to offer two starting levels of professional trainings designed to support those of you working with clients or populations dealing with the effects of adverse childhood experiences and complex trauma. The Level 1 Online NARM Basics Training is a psychoeducational training designed for helping professionals in a variety of fields, such as mental health professionals, substance abuse counselors, educators, doctors, nurses, other healthcare providers, coaches, and more. The Level 2 NARM Therapist Training is a comprehensive clinical training designed for licensed mental health professionals, as well as current mental health graduate students and clinical interns and trainees. For more information on these NARM trainings and to apply, please visit www.narmtraining.com forward slash schedule. And now for our interview. Dr. Sarah Rappaport graduated from Bastyr University in naturopathic medicine. She is trained in the neuroaffective relational model and focuses her work on mind-body practices for health, including somatic counseling, breath work, massage, and meditation. She is also a board-certified biofeedback provider. Sarah has a deep passion for nature and the earth and believes that some of the best medicine in the world is the kindness and compassion that we can offer to one another. Please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Sarah Rappaport. All right. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Sarah Rappaport. We're so happy to have you here today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as you might know, we begin the podcast with the question that we often ask clients in an arm session, and that is, what would you like listeners to get out of our conversation today? Yeah, I'd love people to just get a better sense of how more knowledge about the mind-body connection can help people, my patients, clients, access a greater sense of agency. Mm. A greater sense of agency. Perfect. Yeah. And like, The way that I explain this to folks is that a lot of people, I think, in our culture don't get a lot of education or knowledge about their bodies. And so I think a lot of people end up walking into a doctor's office, uh, you know, another practitioner's office, kind of being like, you're the expert. I don't really know anything. Mm -hmm. And what I really like to do in my practice is really help people understand how they can be the experts of their own body. And I often find that people, when they really understand oh, this is how my body works and there's nothing wrong with me and this is just normal, there's this deep sense of relaxation that can start to occur in people. And it doesn't put the doctor on a pedestal anymore. It really puts the doctor and the patient on the same level. Mm. I'm so excited for this conversation, I can't tell you. (laughs) Okay, so that's a beautiful place to start. Agency and recognizing that we as humans can be the experts of our own bodies. And when we go to a practitioner, they are really there to support us in our process. And that's really, really beautiful. Absolutely. I love it. So if you could start, tell us a little bit more about the work that you're doing and you know how you got into the field of complex trauma. Yeah. So I do a lot of different things in my office. I do some basic naturopathic care just for folks that oftentimes are just wanting a practitioner that has awareness of the mind-body connection, oftentimes wants a practitioner to manage other aspects of their health that do have kind of a background or a history of complex trauma. I also work in the medical management of folks that have eating disorders. I do some standalone NARM work and I do biofeedback as well. Okay. I also do massage. I forgot about that. I love the variety. (laughs) I know. I just like to keep it interesting for myself. A woman after my own heart that just does all the things. I love it. So you got into, I mean, you're a doctor. So, and a naturopathic doctor. Yeah. So what brought you to that field and that work? Oh my gosh. Well, I feel like getting to the place where I study naturopathic medicine and getting to the place where I started specializing in complex trauma are kind of the same story. Okay. So the history of kind of where all this started is really from an origin story of my family has a lot of intergenerational trauma. So I'm 100% Jewish. Everyone going back in my family is Jewish. My mom is a first-generation American and my dad's second generation. So 
they both grew up extremely poor, extremely in this context of, of really trying to survive. And so my brother was born maybe like two and a half years after I was. And we immediately started to understand that there was something developmentally not totally going right with him. So it ended up being 15 years later that he was finally diagnosed with a rare metabolic disorder. So I became fascinated with neuroscience and with medicine at a young age just because I had this brother that was just developing very differently from myself. And I grew up going to occupational therapy appointments and physical therapy appointments and kind of being his helper mm. in a lot of ways. And so I was very identified with that role as a child, really, because the whole family was very organized around how do we help my brother? How do we manage this? And the way that I found to survive was being somebody that could be helpful. So I went to college. I studied neuroscience and molecular genetics. And I actually ended up working in one of the research labs that studies the metabolic disorder that he has. So very involved. Was that just coincidence or was that like you steered at that direction? It's complex. I did steer it in that direction. And I think a lot of kind of magical things happened that got me there. But I was so identified with being this person that could be helpful and really kind of in the savior role in my family of like, I can be the one that helps, mm -hmm. that I really continued to feel like through all my college years that that was my role in life. The cracks started forming, though, as they always do, where I started really getting quite depressed and quite anxious. And at that time, I didn't really have a sense of why that was. I ended up realizing that something was very wrong internally for me, and I ended up moving to a farm halfway across the world to Israel, actually, and studying permaculture design. And so it was when I was there that I started to actually realize, like, Maybe there's a way for me to do medicine on my own terms. I became fascinated with herbal medicine. I ended up studying with an acupuncturist for a while while I was there. And now that I look back on it, I still think, oh, gosh, I was so identified still with that role. But in a way, like I was starting <laughs> to do it in my own way. And I started to tell myself, like, OK, it's mine now. And I, there was still a lot for me to work out there. But the acupuncturist that I studied with is actually the one that turned me on to naturopathic medicine. And while I was in school for naturopathic medicine, I never would have imagined that I would have been someone that works with complex trauma or does a lot of counseling in my office. But as I started to recognize all the pressure that I put on myself and how that affected me as a student, as a clinician, I was like, something is really needs to change for me here to really show up in the world. And we had a, a professor who's now retired, but he was the head of the mind-body medicine department, and he exclusively did biofeedback and mind-body medicine in his practice. And I actually ended up going to see him as a patient, and my whole life changed with just learning about biofeedback and learning about my body and being like, oh my gosh, I am holding on to so much anxiety and so much tension. And recognizing that in myself started to propel me towards getting a really big interest in mind-body medicine, in polyvagal theory, and really helping people in the way that I had been helped, which ultimately led me to NARM. It's a really long story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so ultimately... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe it. You And you don't have to share all of it, but I'm, I am curious because that is a little bit of a jump. I mean, not, you know, in the trainings, we don't have a whole lot of doctors coming through. So I'm curious what did kind of help you make that jump. In naturopathic medicine, we have a principle. We have six principles that we live by. And one of those principles is identify and treat the cause. In our first year of education, something that's really kind of honored is our philosophy and what treating the cause actually means. And the really old school naturopathic medicine were, and a lot of people still practice this way, is, is vitalistic medicine. And that's this belief that the vital force is what helps us heal. So it really kind of holds this principle that we are our best healers and this understanding that there's all these ways in which our vital force gets blocked. A lot of that is from our own internal strategies. So 
that really sparked my interest as a first year ND student of like, oh yeah, like we get to work with this thing, the vital force that in allopathic medicine is not, it's not a concept. And we got told this a lot as we were going through school that like, you might start to, you know, not hear about the vital force as much anymore um, because a lot of naturopathic medicine has become a lot more allopathic in its education system. So I started to kind of be like, well, what happened to that? Like what's actually going on with that vital force? And different people were practicing with it in different ways. So some people use a lot of energetic medicine. I would say acupuncture really works with the vital force. Homeopaths really work with the vital force. None of that was really feeling kind of like my thing. I've always felt really drawn towards agency interventions. And so when I found mind-body medicine, I was like, oh, this is how I get to work with this. And when I found NARM, I was like, this is actually what naturopathic medicine is all about. I read about NARM and I read about how NARM works with the vital force. And I was like, this is actually the same thing to me as naturopathic medicine. I love that. And it reminds me of that quote by Larry, just about how the impulse is toward healing. I read that quote. That's what brought me to Narma. I was like, oh, this feels like truth. This is right. That's what I'm hearing you say. Exactly. That's always been something that we've held in naturopathic medicine. And when I heard Larry say that, I was like, he gets it. And I love that quote because that's what I'm always holding for my clients and my patients is that They're all trying to figure that out or find that in themselves. It's just about, can we understand what's getting in the way? Yeah, that's beautiful. So you kind of gave us, I feel like, a little teaser of the complex trauma part. So you came to NARM, and I mean, did that kind of just all come together with the complex trauma part? Is that what brought you to this field? Yes, and... I was interested in complex trauma before I found NARM. I was really, the last two years of my ND education, I got really into polyvagal theory. I got really into Bessel van der Kolk. So all of these people that were kind of more in the somatic uh, methodologies around trauma healing started to become a really big interest to me because of just what I was seeing in my patients and seeing in myself. So that interest was there. I think within my own work internally with complex trauma, I still had some stuff internally that I think I was still trying to figure out that actually NARM really helped connect for me. So in a way, like NARM feels very much like the culmination of like, oh, yeah, I finally arrived exactly where I've wanted to be in this field of complex trauma. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I'm hearing lots of different threads coming together. What in your life has brought you to this place? And it's really exciting. Totally. (laughs) It's really exciting. Yeah, yeah. And so you said when you found NARM, and I'm just curious, can you tell us how you found NARM? Like, how did you come across? I had a chance meeting with another NARM practitioner. And at that point, I was thinking about doing a training in internal family systems or somatic experiencing, and I I didn't really feel decided. I just knew that that was something that I wanted to do. And he told me about NARM, and I was like, I've never heard of that. I don't know what that is. But I went on the internet and I started learning about it, and it was that piece about the vital force that really hooked me because I hadn't heard about that in any other modality. So... I ended up kind of waffling back and forth and I ended up signing up for the training and I had so much anxiety about it because I was like, what if it's not what I think it is? What if it's terrible? And just like the first like 15 minutes of the training, I was like, no, this is exactly what I wanted. You're right where you were meant to be. Exactly. Wonderful. And so you said that you offer standalone NARM sessions. I'm curious if you find yourself weaving it in other ways into the work that you do. I do. It's a both and thing. Oftentimes people will seek me out because of a history with complex trauma, and then we'll just talk about what they're wanting for themselves. And sometimes that looks different. Oftentimes it'll kind of show up in different ways where I tell people a lot of times like, okay, like this is oftentimes a combination sort of visit is that I'm kind of looking at lifestyle things. I'm looking at kind of how you're living your life and how that contributes to your health. But I'm also going to be looking at it from this counseling angle and how that interweaves. So sometimes, you know, in the first office visit, I'll just get a history on people and we'll end up talking about things like nutrition and sleep. And so much will often come up in those things. 
like I I had a a patient a while ago that we just started talking about sleep and it was actually so emotional for her to talk about that we ended up just doing a little bit of norm work just around the sleep. And she was able to feel like, oh yeah, like I have this greater sense of agency around my sleep habits now. So it's interesting how sometimes I'll just kind of have these little mini NARM moments within a session where people kind of get that feeling of like, oh, I can do these things. I can take care of myself because it's really hard to enter a process with somebody where we're talking about these things, sleep, food, to really hold this, how do I want to say this? When people really want to make changes in sleep and food, but they're also being really hard on themselves, there's almost no way that myself as a clinician can work with that, not from a NARM context. Mm. Because I'm not going to push beyond that. I'm not going to push past this defense All I can do is be curious about it and hold the openness around like, we don't have to work on this today, but if that's what you're wanting for yourself, then would it be okay for us to just explore like what's there, what gets in the way? And then I'm not that person that's trying to push beyond because I do find, you know, that there are a lot of clinicians, naturopaths included, that are like, well, just do the thing. Like, it's not that hard. Just push beyond what's going on for you. Just get to sleep at 8 p.m. Just drink your water. Just (laughs) And this is such a wellness culture thing, too. It's just like, I saw this post the other day and this, I think it was a doctor or somebody else was just like, it's not that hard. Just wake up at this time, go to sleep at this time, do this, do that, be disciplined in all these ways. And it's just like, for who does that work? Yeah. You know, we can't just put these expectations on people and expect them to meet them. And so from my perspective, I just get to kind of be unattached to the outcome and explore with people, okay, like why don't we just develop a sense of curiosity around this thing? And then maybe over time, like you start to realize that it changes for you. So that's one way in which I really see that showing up in my practice. And then, you know, another way is because I do a lot of medical management of folks that have eating disorders, I often find that NARM is such a helpful way to help organize our sessions because it's like, yes, I'm here. I'm going to talk to you about your body. I'm going to talk to you and not in body terms. I'm going to talk to you about what's going on in terms of like your heart rate and all of these things that we just kind of record. But I'm here to talk about those things. And I'm also here to see you as a human being and understand the complexity of what you're presenting with. So I really find that NARM is so helpful for me in those visits because I don't really want it to feel like a doctor's visit 100%. I want it to feel like you're a human here and, you know, I'm going to tell you what my concerns are. I'm going to tell you what often helps with those concerns. And I'm really going to hold this position um, and hold this place to see you in your humanity in this appointment. Hmm. As you're talking about that, I'm like feeling myself just relax because earlier when you were talking about wh- whoever it was that said, just just it's easy. Just do the thing. Just go to sleep at 8 p.m. or whatever. I was finding myself feeling anxious, like even just you talking about it. Like I felt like, yeah, I want to tell this guy it's not that easy for everybody. Like we all have things that get in the way sometimes. And then even just now, as you're talking about, I'm, we're just going to be curious. I'm just going to hold this space for you. Sure. I'm going to tell you my concerns and maybe some things that we could do to support those elements. But ultimately, I'm just going to be here with you as a human. And I just felt myself relax. So <laughs> clearly that work is really important. We all we all need someone to, to be able to sit with us in that space sometimes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love, I'm going to use that phrase, a mini NARM moment. <laughs> I find myself having these mini NARM <laughs> moments. I find that in parenting. I find myself having mini NARM moments. Yeah. 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 yeah I love that. Yeah. And actually like an interesting side note too, of like one of the reasons that I got into the medical management of eating disorders is that I started to see even within my own profession, how unfortunately there are some folks that started to kind of create eating disorders in people. Mm -hmm. So when we start labeling foods as good or bad or right or wrong, as often is done in the wellness community, I think they don't have the intention to be harmful at all, but it ends up being harmful to people because people start to have this feeling around, well, I can have this, but I can't have this, or this is healthy, or this is not healthy. And for me, it's part of this social justice piece around how I want to show up as a practitioner 
to hold this different position around all of that, to hold the position of saying, you know what, like actually all food is good food. You know, feeding yourself is no matter what that food is, is an act of self-love and self-care. And to kind of hold this position, you know, separate from some other people in my profession of really kind of standing that ground of curiosity and compassion around all things. Yeah. And for me, as you say that, I'm just thinking, yeah, that's what helps us get away from that binary black and white thinking, especially around food, if we're talking about that, that in our culture nowadays, there is so much of like, eat this, that it can really feed that beast kind of. And I can imagine how how useful NARM would be in those moments with those clients and patients that really need that. Totally. Yeah. So, okay. So you're giving us a little bit of a snapshot of what it is that you do. I'm I'm curious if you have any stories or examples that you could share with us, you know, either from your own life or with patients that you feel like would kind of illustrate the work that you're doing. Well, something that was really cool to me, I think, in what we were talking about in these like mini NARM moments is all the ways that these little NARM moments actually help people connect to themselves better. So the one thing that I'm thinking of is uh, I have this longtime patient who ended up doing some biofeedback sessions with me because that's what she was wanting. And so that's the direction we ended up going. And we had this really cool session where we were doing some heart rate variability training. And in that training, what you do as a client is that you're watching the screen and there's this red line and the red line is your heart rate. And so part of the invitation is like, okay, can you follow your breathing along with your heart rate and just see how that goes? And so I think this was her first time doing it and she was following along. And then I saw like something happen in her. And so I paused it and I was just like, what's happening right now? Like, what are you noticing? And she started crying and she said like, oh, I can feel my heart. Like I can feel that I'm connected to this. And to me, it was almost like my brain exploded where I was like, wow, I had no idea that anyone could feel that mm-hmm. way just by doing this exercise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And to me, it felt like the exact same way that NARM sessions feel to me of when people just have that connection to themselves and suddenly this big shift starts to happen in them. And for me, it was this recognition of like, that can happen outside of this traditional norm structure, as long as I'm still providing and holding the same space around it. Mm. And that was just a really cool download for me to be like, wow, like there are actually so many possibilities within a norm framework that I think I'm still realizing and probably will be for a very long time. Yeah, there's so many layers there. Gosh, I felt that when you shared that story, just the idea of feeling so connected to your own heart. It's that heartfulness, right, that we talk about. Yeah, um, yeah. And in that moment, I just, I got a little taste of it. I just felt it, what she, I think, was feeling. That's really, really just a lovely example. Yeah. And a big chunk of my practice is just NARM at this point. I would say like 70%. Mm-hmm. So in a lot of ways, it's probably not too different from other NARM therapists, I had a lot of clients this week just share the most like touching and beautiful revelations about themselves. And it helped me to just recognize and realize like, this is why I'm here. This is why I do the work that I do. Because to me, like the best feeling that I have is just holding that space for people to come into their own agency. Like there's nothing in this world that I think brings me greater joy than seeing that. Yeah. I'm curious, would you be willing to share any of your own personal experiences? Because I know this has been, and I know we've talked, if, if we can just let <laughs> listeners in on on something. We, we tried to record this episode earlier and we had some technical difficulties and we both kind of were like, I think maybe the universe is telling us we need some more time. And we both kind of discovered some things, I think, since we last met. And so I'm curious, you know, you don't have to share, but I'm curious if there's anything that you would like to share in terms of your own process and experience with NARM. Yeah, yeah. I know. I'm I'm so thankful you brought it up because so much internally has shifted for me. So when Emily and I first met, you know, with all those technical difficulties, I was also 
with my own awareness of realizing what I was coming into recording this podcast with, Mm -hmm. where I was like, okay, I have to like figure out what I'm saying. I have to have a really clear message and you can just hear it. Like you can hear all the pressure that I'm putting on myself in this, right? And so I come in and I'm like in my sympathetic nervous system, I'm like blazing hot internally. And yet I'm trying to record this (laughs) podcast and trying to speak about something that for me very much lives in my parasympathetic nervous system. So I was almost happy that the technology wasn't working for us because after that, what started to really shift in me is I was almost able to see all of my strategies as almost like this ether or this cloud that started to exist around me. And it almost felt like a movie where I could like see all these little strategies and I could just look Hmm. around and be like, do I really need to do this right now? Hmm. And like, what do I really want for myself? Because ultimately what I really want for myself as a human being is to show up in my humanness and to show up authentically. And for me, that really involves dropping how I think I'm supposed to look or what I think I'm supposed to say or trying to fit into this idea of how I should be presenting myself or naturopathic medicine or anything to just drop all that and honor the fact that I'm a human being, just as I do with my clients and with my patients. So it's actually been such a gift for me over these past couple of months to come into this recording and show up in a completely different way in my humanity. So it's a very meta-NARM process, right? (laughs) To be like, we're recording this podcast about NARM. This thing happened that's very meta-NARM. And like now I'm talking about it, which is even more. And we're (laughs) we're having this mini-NARM moment right now as we're talking about it. Yeah, very cool. Exactly. Very cool. And it's profound because, I mean, yeah, to pull the curtain back on my experience too, I was pressuring myself. I was like, I got to figure out how to get all this technology. Like, what am I doing wrong? I got to figure this out. And so we were both having that experience and now we're coming to it. And it felt like there's coming into it. There's just so much more ease and we could just be ourselves (laughs) in this moment. Yeah. Yeah. Like how beautiful for us both to just recognize that and like find our way in that. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. It's really cool. Very cool. Well, I feel like there's so many more questions I could ask. If I could ask just a personal note in terms sure. of the the work that you saw yourself doing when you were kind of on the path of showing up in your family in a certain way and being the helper in that way. I'm curious if that shifted at all, if that's not too personal to ask. No, not at all. Um, massively, massively. I actually do credit NARM with a lot of the ways in which that's shifted in a major way. Part of that shift started when I graduated from college and moved to the farm in Israel, because I think it was really the first moment that I did something for myself that wasn't about anyone else. Hmm. I recognized my last year of school that I really wanted to put my hands in the dirt. I became fascinated by permaculture and by sustainable living. And that was the first time that I really was guided by that desire inside of me. So I think sometimes the way that I look at it is kind of like if if I'm like this complex Pandora's box or something, it was almost like a cog started turning with that. And I think a lot of the decisions that I started making after that were towards this place of more vitality within myself. I think where a lot of NARM starts to play in is that I started recognizing that I was still bringing some of that energy into my appointments as a clinician. So I started to feel myself a lot at the end of my schooling and at the beginning of my practice, really feeling like these feelings of like, I'm not being helpful enough, or I'm not doing a good job, or honestly, like feelings too of like this misplaced or this projection of anger sometimes towards my patients where I was like, what is that? Like, I know that's not about them. This really feels like it's about me. And that projection was always kind of like, oh, they're not doing this to get better. And I really wanted to explore that in myself because I was like, I can't keep bringing this into my sessions with people. And so really through my understanding of myself, really through a NARM context, I started to become able to recognize what that was all about. And how I was still holding that feeling of 
feeling like I really needed to save or to be the one that does all the things that solves the problems. And that was that same trauma from my childhood showing up in a different way. And what NARM has really allowed me to do is to create that separation between myself and my clients and my patients to be like, cool, what I'm holding here is all these things that I know about health, that I know about your health specifically, what makes that better, what can support that. And ultimately, you get to decide where you engage on that. And so I knew that, but really feeling into that for myself, really feeling like, okay, I'm over here, you're over there, and I'm holding this love, this compassion, this support for you, but it's not my job to make you better. That has shifted everything for me. And I really had to feel that on a deep level, because even though I knew that on a logical level, I didn't feel that for so long. Gosh, I'm just feeling so much appreciation for that way that you're approaching the work and how you practice because speaking for myself and my interactions with healthcare, and I've had my own kind of slew of health issues, I don't know a better way to say it. And I haven't often felt met in that way of this is what I know. This is what I know about your health specifically. And ultimately, you know, this is your body and your choice in how you go forward with this work. And I I just felt really moved and touched as you were talking about that, because I just think of how many folks probably, you know, not unlike my own experience, have been met with an energy of I need to fix you and then feeling like acted upon in that way, if that makes sense. Like I need to be fixed. I'm a problem. And gosh, I'm feeling emotional just as I'm talking about it. That's not a fun place to be when you're sitting in front of a, you know, a healthcare provider to feel like we need to be fixed and how different that is and would be for more folks to be able to sit in front of someone like you in the way that you're practicing. It's just a very different way of approaching our own bodies. And I imagine that that's, again, really powerful in the healing process to relate to ourselves in such a different way and have a healthcare provider relate to who we are as humans in such a different way. So yeah, just feeling so much appreciation for the work that you're doing and and the others like yourself are working in that way. Yeah. And I I feel so touched by what you're saying too, because I feel that pain. Like I feel how people have been treated in the medical system and how to me, it feels so obvious that what's happening is that we get so scared as doctors. We get so scared that our patients are going to die, that our patients are going to be sick, that we're doing something wrong, that that we're causing harm. And for me, I've had to really put that aside as much as I possibly can So I can really see the person that's sitting in front of me because I realize I am doing harm, actually. And such a principle of medicine is first to no harm. But I think a lot of doctors don't recognize that this is a big way in in that they start to enact that is that when we put these expectations on people, when people feel like they have to be fixed, no one can heal in that container. I want to like highlight that. That is so powerful that that's so powerful. Yeah. And I wish that there could be a way for doctors to start to recognize that in themselves and for our medical system to really start to organize around that principle. And I have huge thanks to my current mentor, Dr. Sarah Santel. She holds this principle so well. And every time I've questioned myself or any time I've been like, am I doing this wrong? I go to her and she's like, your job is not to fix anyone. Your job is just Mm. to hold this space around here's what I know, here's what can help and you decide. And so like having somebody in my corner that holds the exact same truth has been vital because I think as any practitioner to go out on your own and do something that's different when no one's in your corner feels traumatic in and of itself. It feels alienating. And to know that there are other practitioners out here that are holding that truth for me is so important. Yeah. I think of kind of those pioneers, the doctors that were doing that before they felt that kind of support. And I don't know, obviously, you know more about the field than I do, but it seems like those who kind of have been able to pioneer that, again, I feel so much gratitude and imagine how challenging that would be. And so kudos to your mentor for (laughs) being able to hold that. Yeah. Yeah. She sounds amazing. Yeah. Like, it's funny, she's not NARM trained, but she very much embodies these NARM principles. and. My hope is that there are other doctors out here doing this work and recognizing where our fear gets in the way 
And that doesn't mean it's any less scary. I manage a lot of people with really scary chronic conditions. And that's my work to like work on my fear, to hold space for that, to recognize where I bring that or don't bring that into appointments. You're naming something that is so vital in this work, and that's the self of the therapist part or the self of the practitioner part, that what we're bringing can really impact who is in front of us and and doing our own work, how important that is. It's so vital. So I love that you're highlighting that's been such a an important part of your process. It is. And like, I don't know if this is just who I am and who I've always been as a person, but there's these ways in which I feel like if I start to show up inauthentically, I recognize that I can't show up anymore. <laughs> so it's like I only have like a certain amount of bandwidth for not mm-hmm. showing up authentically before mm-hmm. I start to burst. Mm-hmm. So I'm the kind of person where I started to realize, oh, if I'm showing up in this way I don't like, I'm the only one that has the power to do anything about that. Nobody else can change that for me. To me, like really moving towards authenticity in all aspects of my life feels like the most important thing. And it's crazy to be authentic as a medical professional because I always thought as a kid, doctor is like, you know, it's like you get this idea of what a doctor is and how a doctor shows up and how doctors used to walk into the room where it's like, okay, well, here's what's going on in your chart. And it was like such this position of power and to kind of redefine that for myself as like, oh, it doesn't actually have to look like that. And I can be a doctor in a different way, in this authentic way has been really cool. I love that. And like you said in the beginning, just the difference, there's no hierarchical, we're shoulder to shoulder. And again, just highlighting how different that kind of care feels for the patient because we feel that we really, really do. And something that I do a lot in my appointments, it kind of depends like why people are coming in, but often we'll just talk about the nervous system and about stress and how stress impacts the body in so many ways. A lot of people will come to me with digestive complaints. And I think a lot of the ways that other medical practitioners will handle stuff like that is like, okay, like we'll kind of look at it just from the digestive perspective. And like, maybe it's this functional disorder. Maybe it's actually something that requires an endoscopy or something like that. I like to kind of push that all aside and say like, okay, like what's going on with stress now and how does stress actually impact your digestive system? And like what we know about stress is that your parasympathetic nervous system starts to shut down. What do we need for digestion? Your parasympathetic nervous system. And so what actually happens, I'll just give you like a little bit of a debrief on like some of the stuff I tell my patients, but please, something that happens is like we don't secrete stomach acid when we're in a sympathetic state. So all these downstream effects start to happen when we don't have enough stomach acid. Pathogenic species will start to enter or will get overgrowth. And so all these things can happen, you know, as stress starts to become more of a thing. So oftentimes I will just take out this polyvagal chart with people and I'll be like, okay, the chart that I love is probably one that you've seen online before where it has all these emotional words on the left and then it has more of these physiological words on the right. And then I'm just like, cool, like this is your body. This is what happens in your nervous system when you're dealing with a lot of stress or when all of these things happen that you might have mentioned before. And we just go through it and we start to kind of piece together the pieces of like, oh, yeah, digestion feels really hard when you're in this state. Makes perfect sense. Here's why. Or, you know, a lot of times what I'll do as well is like, I don't like treating a lot of functional digestive disorders with like a really heavy hand at the beginning. I'll just kind of say like, okay, like stress is involved here. How do we help understand that? Are there ways you know that you put stress on yourself or that your environment is stressful in ways in which we can start to explore? Because that might just impact your digestive health entirely. And we don't need to make you spend all this money on all these things. Mm -hmm. So people love that because, and it goes back to my intention for this episode is that It gives people such a sense of relief to be like, oh, all this is actually connected and my body's just trying to protect itself. And yes, some other things go wrong when my body's trying to protect itself, but it all makes sense. And that's where people start to recognize that there's agency in all of this, because if it's something that's happening to you, you can't do anything about it. If it's something that you're an agent in, at least in part, that doesn't mean entirely, right? Mm -hmm. Then at least you know how to show up 
And I think people just understanding that little psychoeducation piece can start to be like, oh, right, I'm a person in this body. I can do things to support myself. I got really excited as you were talking about that. Again, thinking of some of my own pieces and things that I'm working through and navigating with my health right now. And I love what you're saying that because, you know, and not that I go blaming myself necessarily for all of the things that have come up in my body, but this agency piece that you're talking about. And again, that's such a foundational part of the work that we do in NARM. But the agency piece, it's so empowering to be like, oh, there are things actually that I can do to really support my body. Again, instead of that feeling of I'm going to show up to the doctor's office, they're going to tell me how they got to fix me and that how powerful that is. And I'm hearing this, I don't know quite how to say this, but like it's stripping away the layers as we're looking at, you know, how do we look at the stress that's coming up in your life? How can we work with that? And it's like peeling away kind of these external layers until you find maybe some kind of more core issue, but that there's so much that can be done. And that's just really exciting to me as I, I, I'm feeling my body getting excited as I'm hearing you talk. Totally. And it's such an interesting exploration, too, because oftentimes, you know, we can't discount the presence of external stressors. But oftentimes what will happen is people will eliminate all these external stressors and they'll be like, and I'm still feeling stressed. And then I'm like, great. Does it feel okay to maybe explore internally what's going on here? Mm. And so it's so multifactorial. That's where my medicine gets a little bit complicated of like, okay, is there something environmental going on here? There's so many interconnections that you start to recognize as a practitioner. And it's really an art that I'm still very much in my learning process around, around trying to kind of see the whole whiteboard full of possibilities and really going towards the one that feels possible. And that's also partially patient engagement of like, where does it feel okay to engage with this today? Maybe it's all the way out here. That's where we start. Again, just feeling my nervous system settling <laughs> because I'm just imagining walking into a doctor's office where that is the approach of, hey, if this feels like too much right now, hey, let's start over here. What's out here that we can approach and how different that feels in my body, even just as you're talking about it. Totally. And like, I think medical trauma plays hugely into this whole picture. I think most people walk into an, a doctor's office with kind of the shield up. I myself will do this too. They're going to tell me what to do and I don't want them to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And so from my perspective, I'm like, as much as I can create the space where people don't feel like they have to do that because all the options are available, the better relationship that we can have. It really touches me to think about as well, because growing up with my brother being very hyper medicalized because nobody knew it was wrong with him. There were a lot of people, a lot of doctors that were just cruel, to say the least. We knew there was something going on. We had a very clear idea of like, these are the symptoms. This is what's happening. And the amount of times that essentially we as a family got laughed out the door, like crazy, just crazy to think about. And actually, what's an interesting part of the story that I didn't mention is that when I went to go study in the lab that studies my brother's rare metabolic disorder, the guy that's a doctor that's the head of the lab is one of the most wonderful medical practitioners I've ever met in my whole life. He is so kind. And that is actually part of what stimulated me to still go into medicine after all of this is that he just always approached his patients with this openness and this kindness that I had never really seen before. And just like endless options of like, here's this thing we can do. And I think when you're a doctor that works with really rare metabolic disorders that often don't have really good treatments for them, it often puts you in this position where you're used to a lot of people not doing particularly well. And I think being in that position in a way helps to hold space for like, I'm just here to support you because this is so hard to work with and can be so traumatic as a family to be supporting somebody that has a rare disorder. So I think from his perspective, it's, you know, in a way, like he was just so used to that, that it became easier for him to say, like, I'm just going to be kind and compassionate and open. I'm sure he was always like that because he's just that kind of person. But mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Really special. You're naming the heartfulness yeah, piece, right? Yeah. And having a heart that can be open as a practitioner in that way, that's the special kind of showing up 
it's a special kind of heartfulness, I think that hopefully all of us as clinicians in whatever field that we're in, that we're developing that way of being with instead of doing to, you know, which I'm again in the field, I think it probably would get really easy to get in that mindset of doing to when you're a doctor and yeah, you're really describing that heartfulness piece. And then you mentioned the relationality piece too, like that there's this relationship, the way that you're working and that it builds the relationship. And of course, in NARM, how we believe that's part of the healing, right? Is that relationship. Totally. So you're naming all of that. And like every day I learn about that. And like part of the humanity piece that always comes back in is like, for me, always holding that I'm going to make mistakes. And like, I was so reticent to hold that for myself for so long. I was like, well, if I can just really be perfect, then I won't make mistakes. You know, you can you can hear the irony in it all. Like you can hear that. Right, right, right. But for so many years in my life, I believed that. And now I'm always just kind of holding that principle of like, what if you're just a person that makes mistakes? What if you're just human? And that's released me from so much because I think about it in terms of parenting a lot too, of I'm not a parent, but I think about parenting a lot. And parents aren't perfect. They can't be. But what's really healing that I see in parenting is a parent being like, I messed up. How do we repair this? And like, I think the same really needs to be true of myself as a practitioner. Sometimes I'm not fully attuned. Sometimes I recognize like after something happened, like, oh yeah, like I I really, I want to show up differently there. All I can really do is say, hey, I noticed I didn't show up in the way that I wanted to. How can we move forward? How can I apologize? How can I be present to you in a way that feels really good to you? And it's hard because it's like, oh, all the defenses come up. I want to hide. But holding my humanity is the kindest thing I can do for myself. And when I put it all in that context, I'm like, yeah, this is actually the only way forward. I feel like that feels like such a core piece to all of this. That is the only way to move forward in our humanity and to own when there's a rupture and the the repair is so powerful. And is it, you're speaking to it in terms of both parenting and as a clinician, how powerful that is. Again, I'm just imagining a doctor saying, hey, I, I noticed that I didn't show up in the way that I would have wanted to. How can I repair that? Wow. Right? I'm like... <laughs> It's crazy to think about, too, because even as you say it, I'm like, why is that not a thing? And then I'm like, yeah, it's like it's rarely ever a thing. But I hope, too, that like there are other doctors listening to this that maybe even aren't NARM trained that can start to take some of that to heart of really meeting patients with what they need and what they want, because it's just so vital, like our healthcare system shouldn't be a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. Sarah, thank you so much. This has been such a rich conversation. I really, really enjoyed it. It's obviously been very personal for me. So I appreciate you being willing to share your own personal experience and letting me kind of show up in the same way. As we close, if there's anything else that you'd like to share, and then also how can listeners get in touch with you and the work that you're doing? Yeah, I feel well-rounded and I just want to share my feelings on like, just thank you so much for sharing little bits of yourself and for holding this really beautiful space. I'm just so appreciative of you on this conversation. And you can find me at my website. It's www.drsarahrappaport.com. I have an Instagram that I very rarely use, but you're also welcome to shout out to me there. And a LinkedIn, like most people, that I also rarely ever use. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we'll put those links in the show notes so the listeners can get in touch with you and see what the work that you're doing. And remind us where you're located in case there's anyone local to you. I'm in Portland, Oregon. Beautiful, beautiful. All right. Well, thank you again, Sarah. Dr. Sarah Rappaport, we're so happy to have you here and appreciate the work that you're doing and how you're showing up in the NARM community. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Emily. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us for today's episode. To find more about our guest and their work, check the show notes or visit us at narmtraining.com slash transforming trauma. Are you working with clients or populations dealing with the effects of adverse childhood experiences and complex trauma? 
If so, we invite you to consider joining us to become trained in the neuroaffective relational model in support of trauma-informed care. We are excited to offer psychoeducational and clinical trainings for a variety of mental health professionals. For more information on these NARM trainings and to apply, please visit www.narmtraining.com forward slash schedule. Thanks to Andrea Klender and the Creative Imposter Studios for producing and editing, to Tori Essex for our album art, and to Brad Kammer for the creation of this podcast. We look forward to building community, connection with you, and changing the world by transforming trauma.